Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome to Basketball History 101. I am your host, Rick Loiza. This is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And seeing as this is the very first episode of the podcast, I thought what better place to start than with the very first basketball game ever played. To do that, I need to take you back to the year 1891 to Western Massachusetts in a town called Springfield. There we find a school called the School for Christian Workers. It's going to later be renamed the YMCA Training Center. It was part of the YMCA network. And at this school, men trained to become secretaries. For the most part, women were still not allowed in the office. So this was a man's world. This is the 1890s. So these men were studying to become administrative assistants. And at this school, we have a PE teacher from Canada named James Naismith. He's about 30 years old when he takes this job, and he was quite an athlete. When he was in college, he played on the soccer team, the rugby team, the lacrosse team, the track team, and the gymnastics team. And then after college, he played a little bit of pro lacrosse with the Montreal Shamrocks. But anyway, he's here at this training center leading physical education. He would later go on to become a Presbyterian minister. He would get his PhD in theology. And that's why we know him today as Dr. James Naismith. Back then, he hadn't quite gotten that far yet. He still was trying to wrangle a class of 18 men in P.E., He used to call them the incorrigibles because they were a rowdy group of guys. So these were guys in their early to mid 20s looking to become secretaries and go into the workforce in some sort of an office setting. So with this group of uh, men, he would often play football in the fall and baseball in the spring. And that was how they stayed fit. But what to do in the winter months? If you've never been to Massachusetts, it can be cold and harsh during winter time. So they always had to take their PE classes indoors. And that meant downtime to an extent. During the winter, they still would work on stuff to stay in shape, but it was more like calisthenics, tumbling, basic gymnastics. There wasn't anything competitive about it like football and baseball. So the guys didn't like it. I mean, they knew what they had to do. It's wintertime. We have to go indoors. We have to do this to stay in shape. But these guys couldn't wait for spring to get back outside and play some baseball. And as the winter months would wear on, these guys became more and more unruly, became rougher, and it was just a, a handful for Naismith to handle. One day, Naismith's boss gives him an assignment and says he wants him to create a brand new game that could be played indoors that was competitive to keep the guys occupied and happy, and he only had two weeks to come up with it. Whatever Naismith could come up with, if it worked, would be shared with the other YMCA facilities around the country. Now he had two weeks to figure this out. So the next day, he goes into PE class, and he takes the games that he's familiar with, mostly rugby, soccer, and lacrosse, and tries to make some sort of a combination of those three games and have the guys play it on an indoor facility or an indoor court. The guys didn't like it. They could not stand the games. Every day, Naismith was going to tweak the rules here or there. Let's move this here. Let's move this here. Uh, More men, less men. Let's move the goal this way, that way. And they just could not come up with anything. The men didn't like it. They didn't know what was going on. And so it was basically a failure. 
With one day left to go before his assignment was due of creating a brand new game, he goes all the way back and just kind of clears the deck, goes back to the drawing board, and starts from scratch on coming up with a new game. He did have a few parameters he had to work within, and these were just kind of circumstance, kind of like it is what it is type of situation. One is that he had to have minimal equipment. He could not create a game that was going to begin requiring like gloves or helmets or sticks or rackets or anything like that because they didn't have the budget for it. So it had to be a minimal amount of equipment, no special shoes, nothing like that. So that's what he's working with as he's trying to come up with it. So the first thing he starts with is the ball itself. What kind of a ball are they going to use? He realized very quickly that he's going to need a ball that's larger in size, something that can be handled with bare hands. He noticed that games with a small ball always require some sort of equipment to handle that ball. Baseball requires a bat and glove. Tennis required rackets. Lacrosse required sticks. He couldn't have any of that, so the larger ball allowed for bare-handed handling of the ball. He also needed to avoid tackling. Remember, they're on an indoor court. You can't have guys tackling each other on a hard surface like they did for football when you're on grass. This is just not going to work. You're going to get floor burns. You're going to get lots of injuries. So no tackling. No tackling means no running with the ball. Because if a guy's running with the ball, then something or somebody has to go stop that guy. So no running with the ball. You can catch the ball and then turn and pass it to the next teammate. So this game had to be passing only. That's how you're going to move the ball around the court. The final thing he realized was that he was going to have to do something with the goals. He could not have a goal like soccer or an end zone like in football because it would tempt the players to try to shove the ball into the goal using brute force. It also would tempt the defense to set up some sort of a wall in front of it like lining up to stop the offense from going into the goal. So he thought to himself, what can I do to get around this problem? And finally it hit him. What if we move the goals vertically? What if the goals are up in the air? Well, that was something different. That, he realized, would require finesse over force. And it becomes a little more difficult to defend. You can't defend a basket that's way up in the air. I mean, to an extent, you may be able to defend the shot, but once the ball's in the air, it was all skill on the part of the shooter. And back then, they didn't even call it a shot. They would call it a toss. You would toss the ball uh, into the goal. So now he was excited. Now he thought, hey, I'm on to something. So he contacts the janitor of the facility and says, hey, can you get me two boxes that are approximately 18 inches on each side? Unfortunately, the janitor doesn't have any boxes, but he does have a couple of peach baskets, and he offers those to Naismith. Naismith says, fine, I'll work with this. And he goes ahead and tries to set those up in the gym. Now, this is a, an important detail. It's a small detail, but it's really, really important. If the janitor had come up with boxes, the game might be called box ball today. But because he had baskets available, it's called basketball. Now, to the game itself. So, Naismith sets up the two peach baskets on each end of the gym. Now, the gym had a running track that went around that was above the gym floor uh, where you could, if you were standing on the track, you could look down to the gym floor. So, the running track went around the room and Naismith attached the baskets to that. So, he attached it to the bottom of the railing of the track. That railing just happened to be 10 feet off the ground, which made the basket 10 feet off the ground, which is where basketball rims are still at today. So it could have been 11 feet, could have been 12 feet, it happened to be 10, and that's where we still have them today. So now we're getting ready for the very first game. It's around early December. Nobody knows the actual date of the first game. Remember, history often isn't recorded in cases like this because nobody realizes history is being made. These are just regular people trying to do a job, trying to accomplish something in their everyday work life, and nobody wrote down the date. So, but it is early December. We're all pretty uh, sure about that. Now, going into the game itself, there were 13 rules that Naismith had come up with. And I'm not going to go into detail on all 13, because that's going to make this really, really boring. But I will say this. There was no running with the ball. It was passing only. The baskets were going to count as one point if you could get the ball in the basket. They were going to do a tip-off at the beginning of the game and do a tip-off after every single basket. Next, players only got two fouls and they were out 
until the next basket was scored. So if you got two fouls, you had to go sit on the bench and you could not be substituted. Your, your team just simply had to play with one man down. And you had to play that way until the next basket from either team. Then you could come back to the court. So in this early game, there were so many guys as they were trying to figure it out or committing fouls all over the place because they, you know, they're just figuring it out. So there were some times when there was half the bench was filled with players waiting for the basket so they could all come back on. So that first game, Naismith takes the 18 guys that he's got and he just divides them into two teams, nine players on each team. But he doesn't think about substitutes or backups or anything like that. All 18 men were on the court at the same time. So this is how it goes. So it's a little bit crowded, yeah, but that's just how it went. They were trying to just figure it out. And they didn't have an actual basketball the way you think of today. I mean, the guy had just invented the game the night before. So what they used was a soccer ball that was big enough to be handled barehanded and serve the purposes of the game. Now, basketballs would start to be manufactured about a year, year and a half later. But for this day, we all used a soccer ball. And the great thing about it was that the game was a huge, huge hit. The guys loved it. The idea and the challenge of having to toss the ball into the basket was just really neat. They really enjoyed it. And just within a couple of weeks, they suddenly had as many as 200 people showing up to play. So word had spread about this brand new game and guys wanted to check it out. Now, being as that it was December, the players only played the game for a few weeks before it was Christmas break and everybody went home for Christmas break. It's like going home for winter break from college. So everybody went home for a few weeks and they took the idea of the game with them. There was one guy who was from North Carolina, which is about as far south as those students went. A few of the guys were from Canada and then some were from other areas of New England, New York, Philadelphia, and so the game spread really, really quickly because these guys took the game to their local YMCA's where they were from and they loved it. So literally within about a month, month and a half of the first game, this thing is spreading like wildfire all across the Northeast into Canada and again as far south as North Carolina and it was super, super exciting. Different YMCA's even started trying to create their own teams to play against other YMCA's colleges caught on to this because it filled a need that they all had a game that you could play in the winter when it was cold so this was fantastic this was a game that could be played in the winter it was it kept you in shape there was a competitive aspect to it so basketball was just an amazing amazing solution to a winter problem now some of the guys when they came back after the christmas break they wanted to call it naismith ball in honor of the guy who created it he didn't like it he said this is going to kill the game we have to give it a generic name you know like football baseball so we call it basketball and that's the name that just stuck he didn't want to call it naismith ball by the way the game did not keep a box score so nobody knows exactly what the score was of that first game most people agree the game was one to nothing. Now, there were no Steph Currys back in those days. The idea of shooting a ball into a basket was the first time anybody had ever thought of that, at least in this context. I know there's some ancient games like the Aztecs played where you had to toss a ball through a ring. I think there's an old game where Native Americans would have to throw a ball through some sort of a hoop. But in terms of this context, this was a brand new skill. So the guys were learning, should I shoot it one-handed, two-handed, overhand, underhand? Nobody knew, just toss the ball, pray for the best, hope the ball goes in. But one nothing is generally the consensus of that very first game. Some guys do think it's more, but we'll go ahead and just stick at one nothing since that's what most people say it is. But as I said earlier, the game really caught on. Within just a couple of years, some local manufacturers started manufacturing proper basketballs. They were manufacturing rims, nets, everything you would need to have a basketball game. And that just went on to support the game even more because now we had proper equipment that was designed for the game and it helped enhance the game, it helped enhance the development, and the game really, really took off. One of the nice things is that before Naismith died, he did get to see basketball played at the Olympics. 1936, in Berlin, 
That's where the Nazi Olympics, if you remember that, that's where Jesse Owens had won four gold medals against Adolf Hitler's superstar. In any case, that's also where the very first basketball games were held at the Olympic level. And he was invited as a special guest all the way to Berlin to witness his game being played for, for a gold medal. America was there, England was there, Germany was there, Japan was there, Brazil was there. So this was an, a really, really neat way for him to see the growth of his game. It had truly become international. So that was the first game. That's how basketball got started. So thank you for listening. This is uh, one story from basketball's history. I'm going to keep looking for more stories from basketball's history to share with you some of these forgotten or little known stories that really deserve attention. So come back next time and we're just going to keep looking through basketball history, keep digging in. So thanks again and talk to you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday's Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.